This video is all about how we can control aphids and the populations that we can get in our gardens without us even realising suddenly we get an infestation. But in order to understand how we can control them effectively, it's a good idea to actually learn a bit about the insects themselves and that's going to help us to control them in the future. So here we go, let's take a look. So during the late spring and, and into the summer, aphids are born as females and they reproduce um, asexually. So in other words, they don't need a mate. But come the fall, they do. And that's when they then lay eggs to stay there over the winter and then rehatch the following year. So what we're looking at now is the population levels of these guys during the spring and into the summer months. So a single aphid has a lifespan of around about 25 days. That is, it's not been eaten by uh, a ladybird or a ladybug, as you might call it in the, in the US. And during that lifetime, it's going to lay um, or reproduce up to 80 nymphs, baby aphids. And those babies or nymphs are identical to its mother. The thing is with an aphid is it can reproduce every few days. So before you know it, you can be infested with quite a big population. And if you think 25 days, 80, 80 babies over that period, that's an awful lot of insects, isn't it? But if the food source becomes scarce or the plant becomes overpopulated with, with aphids, some of them will grow wings and then fly off to find a new place to colonize and then start the process all over again. That's how they spread. They're very, very prolific and we need to keep an eye on it. Now the thing about aphids is they're, they're a bit like a vacuum cleaner. They'll get onto a plant and they suck all the sap out of that plant and then excrete it in the form of what's called honeydew. And that's when ants will then do what we call farm the aphids and eat that honeydew. That's what the ants are after. Now we can use the ants as a way of finding out whether we've got an infestation of aphids in the garden. Because all you've got to do is look at your plants and watch the stems. And if you see a trail of ants um, climbing up through that, that stem, chances are you've got an aphid infestation in that particular plant. So now we can start looking at how we might want to control it. So how can we control them? Well, I always bang on about the idea of increasing our biodiversity. And in the garden this year, we had an infestation of black fly on one of the hibiscus shrubs here. Now, I could have done what I'm going to talk to you about now, which is make my insecticidal soap, but I left it to the biodiversity I've got here. And in actual fact, the crane flies came in, wiped out that problem that I had, and so the issue was solved. So I didn't have to reach for that insecticidal soap or spray that we're about to talk about now. So we're going to be making this spray using baking soda, not baking powder. There is a So what is baking soda? Baking soda, or sodium bicarbonate, is found in the ground, in nearby lakes, that kind of, that kind of a location. And it's mined, and that's what we have. There's no artificial chemicals or any modifications to it. That's exactly what it is. So it's pretty much an organic kind of chemical-free substance that I'm happy to use, if I need to, in our growing space. Now, when you think about it, our gardens are a very delicate balance of all the different things that we have in there. We've got the, the life in all its different forms, and then we've got what's going on in the soil, and then obviously we have our plants. And it's a unique blend of chemistry and biology, not only above ground, but also below. But sometimes that balance can be skewed somewhat. And at that point, we then perhaps need to look at alternatives to try and get it back into that balance that we're looking for. And if that balance is interrupted in some way, or just slightly off, then bad things can happen, namely pests and disease. So aphids, thrips, spider mites, white fly, green fly, all these guys seem to proliferate when our gardens or our plants have slightly off kilter. And it's at that point we want to be looking at ways to um, arm ourselves to get that balance back into check. But it's not something that we want to be doing all of the time to keep that balance going. A strong and healthy garden with its inhabitants in the same position shouldn't require us to intervene. It should be able to manage and look after itself and keep the status quo. So when my garden and growing spaces, in particular the vegetable patch, is in a good position and is in tip-top condition, I worry less about these um, infestations of 
of insects and are certainly the same with, with the diseases because a healthy plant is going to repel an awful lot of these problems. But sometimes, luckily not often for me, we just need something to give us that little bit of an edge to get us back into the position that we want to be in. We're going to discuss why it works, how it works and how we can use it in moderation. So I've already said that baking soda or sodium bicarbonate is a naturally found compound that we've, we can find in lakes and in certain mineral deposits. So we know that we don't have to worry about anything that's been added to it to get the, to get the article that we're looking for. So being a fairly natural occurring chemical compound, it's made up of the following. There's one sodium atom, there's one hydrogen atom, there's a carbon and there's three oxygens and that's it. But there's two things as gardeners or growers that we need to be aware of with regards to baking soda. Number one is that it's a salt and plants don't like ex excessive amounts of salt in their vicinity. And number two, that will increase the pH level of our gardens. So there's the two key things that we need to be aware of. And with that in mind, we don't want to be using too much of it. It's also really available in our grocery stores because we can use it for baking, we can use it for cleaning and even deodorizing our house. So how does it work with regards to things like aphids and thrips and green fly and all this kind of stuff? Well, let me explain. Once it gets into their systems, lethal doses of carbon dioxide are released and it's fast and effective. The safest way to use it and to be as effective as possible is to get it into a spray bottle so we can atomize it. And by turning it into a diluted spray, it gives us the opportunity to be able to apply it in an easy and effective manner, um, whether we want to control the pests or reduce incidence of fungal infections. Now I use the same recipe, but obviously you can scale it up depending on how much you need, but hopefully you don't need too much. This is based on a litre, so I take one litre of water, I take a teaspoon of Castile soap, or you could use organic hand soap. Don't use dish soap. How many times have you washed up and you find you have to wear rubber gloves? That's because the dish soap has some pretty nasty chemicals in it, otherwise you wouldn't get rid of the grease. So you want Castile soap or hand soap, preferably organic hand soap. Before adding the Castile soap, you want to dissolve one teaspoon of baking soda into that litre first, litre of water first, then add your Castile soap, and then you want two teaspoons of vegetable oil. And there are your four ingredients. The oil's there to help suffocate the insects on contact. And the Castile soap is there to keep it and act like a glue so it stays in the location that you want it to be, either on the plant or actually on the insect itself. So we've mixed it all together, we've got it into our spray bottle, and then what we want to be doing, if we've got a really bad infestation, apply that spray every two to three days. One thing you really do want to do before you do anything else is just do a spray test on a leaf first, just to make sure that you've got the right, the mix is correct, and also you're not going to damage a particular plant that you're looking to apply it to. And there you go. It's made, it's ready to use. You can go and treat any infestations that you may have. But there's a couple of things you might want to bear in mind before you actually go down the route of using this. Is it really the miracle cure that everybody claims it to be? No, not really. But it can be effective if used at the right time and in a controlled way because you're going to get some collateral damage. It will knock out some of the beneficial insects. So bear that in mind. Now for me, when I use it, I make sure I don't have any bees or anything nearby. Bees only tend to come out at certain times of the day. And if it gets too hot, they won't be around. So that's a good time to do it. Have a check to make sure you haven't got any ladybugs anywhere. And, you know, the green fly or the aphids will stay where they are. They're not bothered by anything like that. So that's one way of reducing your collateral damage by considering those particular points. Now, it is going to control this aphid outbreaks that you might get. But the benefit of this particular spray is it's with the, the addition of the oils and the soap, it's got the ability to actually stay where you want to use it. So, now, some people use this recipe as a way of preventing um, powdery mildew. But the thing is with this spray, is that it should only really be used in a localised area. You don't need to go out into your pumpkins and courgettes or zucchinis and start spraying it liberally just in case that you might get mildew. Because remember that you're going you're gonna to be killing off any insects that are beneficial to your plants on contact. So it's best avoided. I know a lot of people say to use it for that reason, but I don't do that. For me, this is the last resort. As I've already mentioned, Crane flies took out an infestation. I had a black fly not that long ago. And that hibiscus shrub looks, looks brilliant now. 
And I also look at the ideas of increasing my biodiversity as much as I possibly can. If I've got pre um, predatory insects here, like wasps, predating wasps and that kind of thing, and certainly ladybirds, then I shouldn't have too much of an issue. So like I say, this is purely a last resort. And with in my increasing biodiversity, I've absolutely no need to be going and buying ladybirds online to then release into my garden, which I actually think is a waste of money. You get a packet of ladybirds, you open them up, they fly away. So increase your biodiversity. And if you want to learn how to do that, here's a video for you to have a look at. And if you want to find out how to reduce your chances of getting powdery mildew, and also how I had a great interaction with a huge bee last year, have a look at this one. But for now, take care, and I'll catch you next time.